You know, I can reflect back on those moments where I had encounters with God and they made a difference in my life. And if it had not been for those encounters, there's no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't be, that I would be, I would not be where I am today. And so this morning we're starting, you guys are in a series entitled Make Jesus Known. And um, I want to kind of feed into that a little bit. But before I do that, let me just say what an amazing church. Amen. Amen. You do things in excellence. It says a lot about your leadership. Would you give it up for your pastors? Would you let them know that you love them? In reality, I believe the only thing that's limiting you is size, space, building, parking lot. Amen. And and obviously, that one thing we, we don't like to talk about sometimes, that's money, to make all those things happen. But I, I prophesy you need to go to two services. Amen. Amen. Listen, if we believe the Lord is soon to return... We believe he's soon to return. We've got to do, we got to pull everything out that we can pull out in order to get people into the kingdom. Because there's people all around us that are lost and dying and going to hell. And we have, we're on a, we're on a mission. We're on a mandate. Amen. To make Jesus known. Amen. So, Pastor, what an honor. First lady, I don't know if they call you first lady or not. Amen. We'll call you first lady. That's, that's our tradition back, back east. And listen, you will go down in history in the Roberts' journal uh, because this is the first church in the Pacific Northwest region that we will have preached in. We visited a lot of other churches, but you'll be the first that we preach in. Just a li- real quick, a little bit of our history. We come from a long-standing pastor, 22 years, and um, our church grew from about 70 to over 800. And the Lord just did amazing things there. And I'm believing God's going to do the same for you. Matter of fact, I believe some of my team and people back east are watching, some of my family. I get, I get emotional every time I think about them. Because we, we love our people. When, when you're a pastor, you really love your people. And so... Pastor, thank you guys so much for what you do here. It's evident that these people have caught a hold of your vision. And I'm believing God's just going to continue to do great, great things right here at this church. Amen. Let me get into the word. And by the way, you guys are amazing. Amen. And just for you, FYI, I love the drums. And you did an amazing job on the drums. Amen. And it's good to see a multi-generational front as well. Amen. On the keyboard and amen. So if you would, grab a hold of your Bibles if you have them or iPhones, however you're going to read it. And if, if you don't mind, remain standing for the reading of God's Word. That's just my culture. Amen. And turn with me in the book of Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. And I'll be reading from the NIV version this morning. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. I feel the presence of the Lord in the house. The word of God says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, you know it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like, I almost want to do it in King James Version. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. I thank you for what I've already felt in this place today. I have felt your anointing. And your anointing is what makes a difference. Your anointing is what breaks the yoke of bondage off of people's lives. Your anointing is what, is, what, is what calls us to a higher level. And God, that's my desire today, that we as a, a body of believers, that God, that we would just step up a notch, and that God, that we would advance your kingdom and make you known, make, make you known to a world that is lost and needs to hear some good news. So we surrender to you. 
Help us as we endeavor to break the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Look to your neighbor and say, you look good this morning. Let me start off this morning by just asking you a quick question. Do you remember the first time you had an encounter with God? I do. I was 12 years old. My grandmother was Church of God in Lancaster, South Carolina. And, and my uh, paternal grand, grandmother was Church of God of Prophecy. And right behind her church, she lived in this little mill house. And she would supply water to that church. And that night, in a revival service, my cousin, 16 years of age, was preaching. There's about 40 people there. And the Spirit of God was moving in a profound way. And um, I knew God was up to something. I didn't know exactly what. But that night, I had my hands lifted and... He came over to me and he said, Doyle, he said, God has something for you to do. But in order for you to do it, he said, you've got to get closer to God. He laid hands on me. And I don't know how many of you have been familiar, have been familiar with being slain under the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I have. It started for me when I was 12. I laid on the floor and it was as if I was metal on magnet. I couldn't get up unless the Lord would allow me to get up. But it was that moment, that encounter, where God made himself known to me. Let me, let, me just, let me just start very clearly, to start off at the very beginning, to say, you have to know him before you can make him known to someone else. Yeah. It, it can't be your mama's religion. It can't be your daddy's religion. It can't be someone else's religion. It's got to be your own. You've got you, you, your own relationship. You've got, to, you've got to know him for yourself. Because, listen, when someone experiences Jesus for themselves, no one, I mean no one, can tell them anything different. And that's where many of you are today. You're, you're here today because you've had an encounter like that with God. And so for those of us that have been serving in the kingdom for a long time, here's an my, my goal this morning was to just kind of get you back for a moment, if you will, to reflect on that, maybe that 12-year-old experience to where when you got up, you said, I want to tell the whole world about what I just experienced. And maybe there's some other people here this morning that maybe you've never experienced that before. I want to challenge you just to pray. I want to, I want to challenge you to ask God to say, God, if this is real, then God, I want to experience you like Pastor Roberts or Bishop Roberts is talking about this morning. I want to know you in that manner. And so what, what I'd like for us all to do this morning, just, just for consideration, that every man and that every woman would look at God and renew their commitment with God. It's, it's sort of like a relationship between a man and a woman making that commitment to one another. Do you, do you remember the first time that you met God at the altar and you gave him your heart? It was, it was at that moment that you said, I want to tell everyone about what I just experienced. It, it's sort of like the same way when you fall in love with your, with your spouse. You're willing to go anywhere you can go um, to be with them. And so First Lady and I, um, Sylvia, the first place I took her to care was to California. Amen. From South Carolina to California. And it sounds very um, glamorous, but in reality, it wasn't glamorous at all. We enlisted in the military, went to Fort Irwin, California. Anybody ever been there in the place? No one in the place has ever been there. You know why? Because it's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's called the Mojave Desert. Amen. Um, it's 31 miles from our house to the fort, and there's a lot of sand, but there's no beaches. Our, our house was a little small shotgun house. Half of this, this room right here, our, the house, our first house, could fit in. It had a, a little kitchenette, 
a living room, a bedroom, and a bathroom. And there was a crack all the way around the wall. We, we cooled the house with what they call in California swamp coolers. Anybody familiar with that? And so, how even know they don't work? <laughs> Amen. But we were in love. And so my point in saying that is that we were willing to go wherever and do whatever we needed to do just as long as we were together. And so it's the same way with us and Jesus. There comes that place in our lives where we fall in love with Jesus and we say to Jesus, I'm willing to do and be whatever you want me to do and be. And so your, your pastors, they've gotten a hold of that. I mean, they come from... Alabama, I believe it was, to come to the Pacific Northwest. Think about it. Five weeks ago, I'm in a church, pastoring a church of 800, been there 22 years. At General Assembly, they asked us to be an administrative bishop, and I knew something was shifting in my life. And here we are. We have a $1.5, $1.6 million budget. You come out here, and you have a $200,000 budget. And you've got everybody running everything. And to leave that and you come out here and be an administrative bishop, it's not a promotion. Somebody help me. <laughs> but I love Jesus enough to be in the center of his will. There's a reason why we're here. And there's a reason why you're here. The first great commandment is to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is how do we love God with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength? How, how do we love him when everybody else is pulling at us? I mean, how, how do we love him when, you're, when your spouse, if you're married, they're demanding your love? How, how do you love him when if you have children that, your children is demanding your love. Your parents are demanding your, your love if they're still living. And your neighbors, your friends, everybody puts a demand on your love. And so as you can see, there's always a demand for love from everyone. So the question is, is there enough love to go around? Every one of us have probably at one time or another experienced what we thought would be that in essence people would love us and we would always expect those people to be there when we needed them, but in some way, shape, or form, those people let us down. So in essence, that what I want us all to understand, there is only one love that will never fail us. There is only one love that will never fail us in the area, in the area of love, and that's through Jesus Christ. He'll never, he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll, he'll never let you down. Listen, when you're, when you're in your worst moment and no one else is in the room, God the Father's there, God the Son's there, God the Holy Spirit is there. How many of you felt that before? I mean, let's face it, life can deal some very serious blows. And we, and we can find ourselves seemingly absent of the people that we've loved. I, I know it sounds morbid, but, but I believe that one of the reasons why God tells us to love him with all of our heart is because by doing so, our heart will remain solidified in him so that our foundation will not be built upon the here and now, but it will be built upon the eternal. Far too many people are living on the here and now. They're putting all their baskets on the here and now, but what about after you die? Do you believe that there's an eternal to go to? Here's what I find intriguing, that in the Scripture or in the Bible, there are two chapters in the Bible that are devoted to one topic. The first one is love, I mean faith, and that is in Hebrews chapter 11. The whole chapter talks about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then there is love, which is 1 Corinthians Love is patience. Love is kind. It does not envy. It's not self-seeking. And so when we talk about love, a lot of people don't know what love is. They think it's lust, but that's not what love is. Somehow, 
People have gotten love confused, especially as it relates to God. Listen to what Jesus asked Simon Peter in John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. When, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he answers him and he says, yes, Lord. He said, you know I love you. Then Jesus looks at him and he says, feed my lambs. So listen to me. When Jesus says things, he says them for a, a specific reason. And so what his focus was, you've got to feed my lambs. Now, he wasn't talking about sheep. What he was talking about, he was talking about people. And he said, if you love me, what you will do is you will make me known to other people. And so the first thing he asked him is, do you love me? And he said, I love you. And again, Jesus asked him the second time. Now, when someone asks you a question twice, it's because they're trying to make sure or they are trying to make sure you are sure. Amen. Are you sure you love me? And so he said to Simon, Simon, uh, to, to Simon Peter again, he said, do you love me? And he answered, Lord, you know I love you, that I, that, that I love you. And Jesus said again, he said it again the second time, take care of my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, he, he doesn't say it once or twice, but he says it the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? But by this time, the scripture tells us emphatically that uh, Peter is hurt. It says he's troubled by the fact that Jesus didn't ask him not once or twice, but now he's asked him the third time. And he said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. Listen to what he says. You know all things. You know that I love you. So picture this, picture, uh, picture this with me if you don't mind this morning. Simon Peter, he, he's the, the voice of Pentecost. The, the man who would stand up and he would preach a message that would birth the church and 3,000 souls would be added to the kingdom. And he's standing there and Jesus is asking him the same question three times. And so th the question is, why? Because Jesus, like I've already said, Jesus never speaks a word without purpose. And so three times, Jesus asked Simon Peter the same question, do you love, love me? And so when we use the word love in the English language, it's not the same as what it is in the Greek. In the, in the English language, the definition of love means an intense feeling of deep affection or to feel a deep romantic or sexual attachment to someone. But when you go to the Greek language, there are three Greek words for love. The first one is eros of which we get the word erotic from, which means sexual. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with sexual love. God's created us to procreate. He, he's created us to love one another with an eros love. Amen? Preferably your spouse. Amen? Help me preach somebody. And may I say male and female. Is that all right to say in Washington? Amen. Amen. And then, and, and then there's the phileo love, which means I'm attracted to you or I feel something for you. And then there's the agape love, which is the highest level of love, which means divine love. And so when Jesus turned to Simon, J Jesus asked him, Simon Peter, do you agape me? Did you get that? Do you have a divine love for me. Do you agape me? Or Listen, he wasn't saying, do you have an erotic love for me? He, he's not saying, do you just want to, do you want an, an, a, a, a type of relationship to where we're just acquainted with one another? He's, he's not asking that. He immediately goes to the level of love that he knows. And that he gives to us. And what he says is, I agape you, but do you agape me? In other words, do you have a divine, do you, do you have a divine love? To, do you have the highest love for me? And Simon Peter returned and answered in the, uh, in the original language is translated, I phileo you. 
I mean, just think about that for a moment. So Peter's response was, I'm attracted to you. His response is, I feel something for you. Therefore, the apostle Peter wasn't where Jesus wanted him to be. So that's why when trouble comes, when you're looking in the face of adversity, it's easy, amen, uh, to say that I don't know this man. And that's why we find the apostle Peter, amen, at a point where he's being accused of being an acquaintance of Jesus. He denies him because his level of love hasn't gotten to the agape love. And so he has this phileo love. I like being around you. I even like being in the boat with you. I even, I even like the stories you tell us. But, but Jesus, I'm not, I, right now, I don't have the phileo love. And, but listen, when you, but when you come to know him, when, you, when you've had your own divine encounter, there, there's no one that can rob you of your relationship. Hence, when trouble comes, you can look in the face of your accusers and those around you, and you can tell them like John on the Isle of Patmos, I know a man who sits high but reaches down low. You, you can testify like the woman at the well after she's had an encounter with Jesus and go, who goes back to her city and begins to tell the people back in her city, come and see a man who's told me everything about me. There's no way he could have known any, no, nobody, I, I've never seen this man before. I'm a Samaritan, he's a Jew. It's not even custom for him to talk to me, but he's coming and talking to me and he's told me everything about me. I, I believe in this man and his, all of her family in the town gets saved. Why? Because she had an encounter with Jesus. And then what she did was she replicated it and went back and told other people. She made Jesus known through her own encounter. Amen. However, at this time, the apostle Peter, even being chosen by Jesus, was not on the same level that Jesus wanted him to be. So Jesus asked him again, do you agape me? Do, do you have a divine love for me? And Simon Peter's response was gotten a little aggravated after the second time. Yes, Lord, I phileo you. He tells him again. I'm attracted to you. Maybe the apostle Peter realized at this point that he could not lie to the Lord. Maybe he realizes that, you know, he knows all things, so I'm just going to be straight up with you. I'm just going I'm to be real with you. Here I am, and this is where I am right now. Maybe, maybe he realized that the Lord knew the condition of his heart in the same manner that he knew that he was going to deny him three times. Maybe, maybe even theologically, the apostle Peter took the high road in, in regards to his humanity and stated indirectly, I'm not sure right now. At this moment, I'm not sure. I, I can honestly say that I'm not where I need to be, but, but God, you know where I want to be. You already, and by the way, you already know where I'm going to be as well. If that's, if, if that's the case, I can accept his honesty. And, and I, I love to deal with people who come and say, I have a few questions. I'm not sure I know him at the level you know him, but I want to. I can deal with that. But this fake sense of love that says everything is good and everything is hunky-dory and it's not it's a dangerous place to be. Amen. He, he wants a deep, intimate relationship with you, and you want a deep, intimate relationship with him. But here's what I find interesting. If you read it in the original text, Jesus said the third time, do you love me? Translate, do you phileo me? Now, why would Jesus go from do you agape me, and he'd come to say, do you phileo me? And then all of a sudden, he answers and said, yes, Lord, I love you. You know I phileo you. In other words, Jesus offered Peter the highest level of love. And when he realizes that he wouldn't come up to it, he brought his question down to the same level of expression of, expression of love that he expressed toward Jesus. And Jesus said, I love you on that level. Now, now listen to me. I'm a, I want you to hear what I did say and what I did not say. 
Amen. I'm not saying that Jesus diminished or lowered his love to come down to his expression of love. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that whatever love or level of love that you're at, he's going to love you unconditionally with agape love right where you are. Isn't that amazing? And so when I think about the apostle Peter's love toward Jesus as phileo love, meaning I'm attracted to you, meaning I'm, a, I'm interested in you. I, I can't but help to realize that there are people here today with a phileo love towards Jesus. In, in other words, you're, they're attracted to him, but, but they haven't gotten quite gotten to the point that they agape love him, to the point that they're willing to give up everything to follow him. In essence, that's where he wants us to be. Listen, if, if, if we're going to make Jesus known, then we, we have to know him at an agape level. It, it doesn't mean that, that we won't follow him. It doesn't mean that we won't get in the boat with him. It doesn't mean that we won't get, go to church and be around him. Um, it, that, that's not what it, it doesn't mean. It, it, in other words, there, there's people sometimes, and, and we've all been there, we, we like going to church. We like feeling what we feel, and we like experiencing what we feel. But in reality, we've never fully surrendered to say, God, I want to make you known through my own life. Not just in church when everybody else is doing it. But on Monday when I go to my workplace, I want, to, I want people to know that I'm different. I, I, I want to be able to speak the truth in love. I, I want to be able to stop in the middle of a convenience store, and if you prompt me and you lead me, I, I want to be able to stop and pray for someone because you prompted me to do so. I want my yeses to be yeses and my noes to be noes. I, I want to be a man of God in the church on the, and the outside of the church. I want to be a woman of God on the in, in and out of the church. And, and so I want to make you known. But what it does mean is that we'll serve him with all of our mind with all of our heart, with all of our soul. So, so, so what would our lives look like if, if we would agape Jesus rather than phileo Jesus? Listen, if everybody in this church left here today and went out and showed agape love to someone, I can guarantee you you're bound to catch someone who needed Jesus that day. And I, and I guarantee you, you would see this church grow exponentially because, listen, we can advertise all we want to. We can send out flyers all we want to. We can put great things out on the Internet. But listen to me. The best way to win people to the kingdom is one-on-one -on -one evangelism. It's called you and me. When they see Jesus in us, amen. So I wonder how many things God would do for us if, if we would just move up just a, a level in our, in our love toward him. If, 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 we wouldn't just, if we wouldn't just have a casual relationship with him that says, I'm attracted to you. What, what would happen if, if we would become so sold out that we actually fulfilled the greatest scripture that says you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? L listen, you can't get your horizontal right unless you get your vertical right. It's got to be right here before it's ever right there. That doesn't sound like a, a casual Christian experience for me. It doesn't sound like a one hour a week affair. It sounds more like to me like the psalmist David where you're, uh, you're in love with him so much in, regardless of what your trials and tribulations uh, come into your life. Like in, he says in Psalm 63, oh God, thou art my God. It's personal. It's me and you, God. And he, then he goes on the right, and he says, early will I seek thee. In other words, the first thing that happens in the morning when I wake up is the first thing I think about is I think about you. Early will I seek thee. Then he says, my soul thirsts for thee in a dry and thirsty land. And he says, I desire to see thy power and thy glory in the sanctuary because our loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. And so regardless where you find David, you find David as a man after God's own heart, as king. He's willing to strip his garments off and sing praises to him. It didn't matter what everybody else was doing, what everybody else was saying, but it didn't matter what he saw. And so he says, I'm willing to give you everything. And so why is this important? 
Because God looked at a world that was held captive by Satan and demonic powers. And he looked at the, the spirits, the spirit and the spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist that's in the world that has come to steal and to kill and destroy. The enemy that is out to destroy every one of us, to destroy our life, to destroy our marriages, to destroy our family. Everybody, whatever category you're in for that matter, God said, I, I have a remedy for that. And he said, what I'll do is I will destroy the works of the devil. And, and I know what some of you probably are thinking. So, some would think that what he would do is he would pull out an arsenal from heaven and he would pull out some extravagant we weaponry or he would send angels down dressed in armor and he would send them after the enemy. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he said, what I'll do is I'll send the greatest weapon I have in my arsenal and we'll destroy the works of the enemy, and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it by sending my only begotten son through love. And he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. I'm so glad there were men and women of the faith that were standing behind this sacred pulpit and they were telling the story about Jesus and they were making him known because one day I was sitting there lost and undone but because of that message, because of what they preached, all of a sudden my life was changed and transformed and God took a, an introvert young man and filled him with the power of the Holy Spirit and I've not been the same ever since because he loved me so much. Can you give God praise right now, if you don't mind, in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. I've got more to say, but I feel like that's where I'm going to stop right now, if you don't mind. So would you stand with me all over the house of the Lord? That's probably the shortest message I've preached in a while. Back in South Carolina, it's normally 45, 50 minutes, if you will. Can we give God praise one more time, if you don't mind? Sometimes I reflect on... His love expressed toward me. And I say to him, God, I don't deserve it. But I am so glad. I am so, so glad that he expresses his love toward me, even when I don't express it toward him like I should. We serve a good God. A good God. I've experienced it. I know what it feels like. If I could take my heart, pull it out for a few moments and stick it into someone else who doesn't know or feel what I feel, I'd do it in a skinny minute. As long as I got it back. <laughs> But I want people to feel and experience the love of Christ. West Coast needs Jesus. East Coast needs it too, believe it or not. Even in the Bible Belt, they need Jesus. But they need a church. And you're one of them. You're one of them. You're not here by mere coincidence. This atmosphere you don't get everywhere. So listen to me. Don't you dare take it for granted. You don't get it everywhere. I've been around enough to know that. There's some places you go in and it's dry as Cracker Jack juice. But not here. And so we need to get more people in here to experience what you are experiencing. The Bible says this, that love is long-suffering. And what that means is it endures. 
The Bible says that it re refuses to give up on people. Let me ask you a question. Is there some people in your life that you've given up on? That you've said, I'm not sure if they will ever get saved. I'm not sure. Don't you dare give up on them. Don't you do it. You keep praying for them. You keep offering an olive branch. You keep praying for them. You keep going after them. Because like the apostle Peter, you don't know how low you got to go before you come up. But eventually, this man gets it. Because at the end, after Pentecost, he stands up, he preaches. And when it comes to look in the face of his accusers and those who are going to persecute him again, guess what he does? He doesn't deny Jesus. He never denies him again. As a matter of fact, they're going to crucify him. And he said, no, no, no. You can kill me, but you're not going to crucify me in the same manner as you crucified Jesus. You can crucify me, but you're going to hang me upside down. That's what, I talk, that's what I'm talking about. He got some agape love. He got the agape love. Amen. In as much as he was willing to die for it. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for your love expressed toward us. I thank you for what I sense in this place. And I ask right now that, God, that you touch Valley View Church and, God, that you would just move them into a heightened level. I, when I walked on the campus this morning, there was someone there to greet me. And when they greeted me, they greeted me because they loved you. They didn't know who I was. But God, I believe they love me too. And God, I believe if there's a stranger here that, that came today that doesn't have family, doesn't have friends, that they don't have a relationship with you and, and maybe no one else in this congregation. But God, today that handshake made, made a difference. Even the messages made a difference. And God, I can honestly say, been the first time in this church myself, I love those people. But more than I can love them, you love them. You love them first in as much as you gave your son for them. And so here's what I want us to do. I know you've already had altar call. But if there's somebody here this morning that you would say to me, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to know him in, in the manner that you're talking about. I want to completely surrender. I want to give him my life. Here in just a moment, when others come, I want you to come to the altar. Or maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I'm attracted to him. I love what I feel when I come to church. I, I love what I'm experiencing when I come to church. I, I love that, I mean, that, that love, that warmth that I feel from when there's no one hugging me, but I feel like someone's hugging me. That what that is is the Holy Spirit. I love that. But now you're saying I want to take my love to a higher level. I want to completely and unreservedly surrender to him. I want to give him everything I've got from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, from the inside to the outside. And here's the third layer of, of altar I want to give this morning. There's someone you're given, you've given up on, and you've wondered, will they ever change? There's that loved one, that, that family member. There's that friend, there's that husband, the spouse, there's someone that needs Jesus. And you're the answer. You're the one who's making Jesus known to them. Amen. Would you would you just make your way to the altar real quick if you don't mind? And I want to pray for you. I want to give my life to Christ or I want to go higher or I need to pray for someone who 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 I you know I'm not sure when and how but I'm believing God that it's going to happen. Amen.